The story I'm about to tell you is one of the most extraordinary tales of our time. It's a story of change, a change which has affected all of us. Some say it's a change for the worse. Others find it a change that is very exciting. to you to judge for yourself whether you think the new sound of music gives you as much lift and as much pleasure as the tones which came out of this late Victorian barrel organ. But one thing is certain. When this machine, with its wooden roll and its metal pegs which tweak little levers to open and close the stops on the organ pipes and produce the right notes, first appeared on the streets, this was, to the many people who heard it, their first experience of recorded music. And once the engineers realized that they could capture the sound of music mechanically, it was inevitable that music was going to change. Instead of a hedgehog robot stabbing out the notes, with a new control system, much grander performances became possible. By triggering several instruments at once using perforated paper rolls, the fairground was suddenly offering robot music as a new attraction. It wasn't long before the new technology found its way into the home, which meant that, perhaps for the first time, the keen musician was no longer limited by his lack of talent. This time, the paper roll triggers the notes using a system of suction. But because the pianola depends for its quality and its tempo on how skillfully I pump with my feet and manipulate the controls with my hand, there's no way that I can be certain of getting exactly the same performance of the piece of music out of the instrument every time I play it. And indeed, the pianola was never intended to be that sort of instrument. But using largely this technology, it soon became possible on a more sophisticated piano to produce identical virtuoso performances every time a piece of music was played. The novelty was electricity, taking all the painful legwork out of pianola recitals and enabling inventors to create a host of quite extraordinary music makers. The strings are fingered by tiny pads pushed up by a battery of electromagnets. Another electromagnet generates the tremolo and an electric motor powers the wheels which bow the strings. And it was electrical contacts made through the perforated paper roll which drove the machine.
Catalano might still be popular today, but for the development of a machine which produced not an automatic performance, but a recording of an actual one. <laughs> the voice of Sir Harry Lauder, replayed on a phonograph. No paper roll or musical box could make a sound like this. The phonograph, and later the gramophone, could capture complete performances. But it was to take another breakthrough in recording equipment before those performances could be changed. This monster of the 1930s was one of the first magnetic recording machines. Today, it's the musician who gets isolated on the other side of the glass-fronted booth. But back in the early 30s, it was the forerunner of the magnetic tape recorder, which had to be safely stowed away. And when you see the material on which it made its recording, you'll understand why the engineer always handled it with leather gloves. Two giant reels like this whirled through the tape recorder at a frightening 60 inches a second. This stuff, a razor sharp band of steel. And when this band broke, as it had a habit of doing, Everybody had to be well clear of the sharp edge as it scythed viciously through the air. But the necessity of forever joining the steel band together became, in the hands of the creative musician, a virtue. When just before the Second World War, German engineers demonstrated that what you can do with steel, you can also do much more conveniently with plastic tape coated with a close relation to rust. With the new tape, and nothing more than a razor blade, new areas of musical creativity became possible. The arrival of tape recorders meant even the most basic sounds could be transformed. Experimenting with music was no longer the monopoly of the imaginative musician. Even the earliest of tape recorders could manage quite happily the faithful reproduction of three notes twanged on the piano. It was the possibilities for unfaithful reproduction which also caused excitement. On this length of tape are those same three notes. If I wind this piece of tape through the machine by hand, at a speed which isn't constant and in a direction which is forever changing, those three twangs become a collection of quite different sounds. In fact, if we re-recorded this performance on another machine, I might end up with a sonata for three notes and tape recorder. And I wouldn't be the first. But let's take this creativity a stage further. Let's find the start of the last note. There it is. I'll cut the tape there. Now I can take the end note, turn it the other way round, and put it back, ready to join up. So, what have we got now? Our first two notes are still the right way round, producing a boing sound with a quick start and a slow finish, or what musicians call sharp attack, gentle decay. But now we've turned the last note the wrong way round. We've got the decay first. Now it's become a sound. And if I finish the joins here, it should sound something like this. Crude stuff, you're probably thinking, but to some people, the possibilities of doctoring natural sound using the new magnetic tape became an obsession. In 1958, a reluctant BBC was forced to allow a tiny group of enthusiasts to get some gear out of redundant stores 
and establish itself here in two rooms in London's Maida Vale. The Doctor Who theme, just one of thousands of signature tunes, special effects and pieces of background music created by the Radiophonics Workshop since 1958. At this time, all over Europe, it was fashionable to make music out of the most unlikely things. An old lampshade, an empty tin can, anything that could make a sound could be doctored by the tape recorder. What have we got here? A box of gravel. Beautiful, beautiful. Something else? Heaven knows what this is. That makes a good noise. We need a basic rhythm, don't we? Well, how about something as mundane as a metronome? That should keep things going. What else could we use? One defunct alarm clock. Gotta have possibilities in it somewhere. Now, add all these bits together on a tape recorder. Play some of them backwards, some of them forwards, some at the wrong speed. And this is what you end up with. Take one cash register, give its sound a similar treatment, and you have an ironic comment about Christmas spending. By playing around with tape, almost anything can become musical. How about the first symphony for one straw? This bizarre performance was recorded to provide the background music for an open university program about particle physics. Cutting out the gasps for air, the best bits of bubbling are selected to make a continuous loop. This loop of bubbles can now be re-recorded at various speeds. Soon there'll be enough bubble noises at different frequencies to play a tune. All these bubble frequencies are now individually transferred to a multi-track recorder before being mixed together to produce the final sound which will back the commentary voice and reinforce in musical terms the message of the program. Having carefully timed the bubble music, it can now be checked to see if it fits the pictures. Add music or effects to even the most academic animation and it suddenly comes very much to life. Armed with a tape recorder or two, the creative soloist can turn himself into an orchestra. This first machine is recording, while a second replays that recording a few moments later 
for it to be re-recorded by the first recorder. Paddy Kingsland explains. I'll show you how it works. Play a note on the guitar. And the notes are repeated. And that'll go on for as long as you like. And what you have to do then is add various lines to that. And the whole thing goes on. You can gradually add more and more sounds. Now, if you get uh, too loud, you can overload the whole system, but it's possible to get a rather big build-up. The leap from the natural to the supernatural came about because the experimenters were no longer satisfied with doctoring existing sounds. After all, why be tied to the strings of a piano when the world of electronics is full of noises of its own. Even if some are not all that easy on the ear. Now that sound is produced because whatever this microphone picks up is being fed to this loudspeaker, back to this microphone, to this loudspeaker, round and round and round in a self-perpetuating shriek of energy. But if we introduce an element of control into that, by only allowing the sounds of a certain pitch to go round and round and round, we've got a new possibility. Well, it's hardly Beethoven, but it's better than it was a second or two ago. Now, this device up here is an oscillator. It works on exactly the same principle. Inside there is an electronic circuit which is producing a noise. A filter removes from that noise the pitch that we want to hear and feeds that back into the front of the circuit. Round and round it goes once again, regenerating itself all the time. Until in the end, all that comes out of here is that one pure frequency. Alter the filter and we can alter the note that this produces. To the engineer, the oscillator is simply a test instrument. You feed that known frequency into whatever it is you're examining and see what comes out the other end. But to the experimental musician working back in the late 1950s, the discovery of the note that the oscillator could produce was like suddenly coming across one key on a piano. So they took one note on a keyboard and used that as the switch to turn the oscillator on and off. Then they found a second oscillator for that note, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, until they'd built up a collection of oscillators big enough to be the basis of supernatural music. The oscillators provide the single frequencies for the tune mixed here with white noise, a hissing sound, a blend of all frequencies, just as white light is a blend of all colors. But there are limitations to what six oscillators and one small keyboard can do. And everybody's life was made easier by the arrival on the scene of an American, Dr. Robert Moog. Dr. Moog showed that one oscillator could produce many notes. Dr. Moog's principle was called voltage control. Each time the musician hit a key or altered one of the controls on the panel, he in effect transmitted a particular voltage across that part of the circuit that he was using. It was this voltage which controlled the output of the instrument, or the synthesizer, as it had now come to be called. Musicians who had been constrained in the past by the particular sound that a piano or a violin or a saxophone could produce, found that with an instrument like this, they could produce the sound, the texture, the quality, the tone, that up to now had only been in their heads. What do I mean by that? Well, listen, here's the note E. Here's exactly the same note. And still the same note. 
Why the differences? Oh, it's just something to do with the tone, you may say. But armed with this equipment, we can be a lot more specific. Let's go back to that first version of the note E. And look at the display on this screen. Now, this is a frequency analyzer. And here you can see that that sound of E is one single tone, one lone frequency. All sounds are waves. And the faster those waves fluctuate in the air, the higher the note that we can hear. So a low note, a sound, has slow fluctuations. A slightly higher note has faster fluctuations. And a really high note has exceedingly fast fluctuations. Look at that on the oscilloscope. Let's freeze one split second in time. And we can see that the waveform which produces the lone frequency is an even rolling shape, which the engineers call a sine wave. Now let's move on to our second version of E. That one. And straight away, we can see a quite different shape on the oscilloscope screen. The same number of fluctuations in that split second but a waveform with a totally different shape. That's called a square wave. And why is it different? Well, the answer lies on the frequency analyzer. Look. No longer one pure tone. There's the fundamental, certainly the main note, that's E, but all these other ones too. Now, they're harmonics. And a square wave includes all the odd ones, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth, gradually dying away. And then, there's our third version of the same note. There on the frequency analyzer, you can see that that one includes all the harmonics, even and odd. And over on the oscilloscope, yet another waveform. Same number of fluctuations again, but a different shape from either of the other two. And that one is called a sawtooth. Using Dr. Moog's voltage control techniques, it's now become relatively easy for the musician to get these different waveforms to interact with one another, producing combinations of harmonics and tones unknown in the world of natural music. But it's clear that anybody who plays an instrument like this and has to concentrate on both the keyboard and the control panel will very quickly run out of pairs of hands. The answer came in the next generation of synthesizers with a computer memory capable of remembering which notes are played on the keyboard. Here, the musician will have both hands free to shape the finished sound of the sequence. Malcolm Clark. Well, that tune is now recorded, but recorded not on tape, but in a memory system, and has recorded the control voltages that control all synthesizers. Unfortunately, I made a mistake in playing the piece, but we can go back and this is what I did. I can ask it to stop. That note, unfortunately, is incorrect. Now by pressing that button, we can hear it's gone. If we play back, there's a hole where it was. So what I'm going to do is going to put it in. That's recorded, but the quality of the sound is not at all as I want it, and this is one of the reasons I've put it in the sequencer, so that my hands are now free to concentrate on the sound quality. Um, because I'm working with the melody in mind, as well as the sound quality, I'm going to put another piece of information in to ask the memory to repeat. We can speed it up if we want to. No, it's going very fast now. Working on this sound pattern now, what I want to try and achieve is the sound quality that is described in a science fantasy play, which is about uh, a house which is completely automatic. 
and uh, I'll just stop the melody for a moment while I'm talking. Uh, what happens when the house becomes dirty is not ordinary vacuum cleaners come out, but tiny robot cleaning mice made of rubber and metal. And they have moustaches that they twirl to pick up the crumbs and little bits and pieces. Because the, the sound of a miniature mouse vacuum cleaner uh, isn't at all like a, a sine wave that we're hearing at the moment, I'm going to change over to our old friend White Noise. And it's going through a filter. Here it is. You can hear the notes, but they're not pitched at all, so I'm going to tighten the filter. That's the sort of whistling sound that I want, but in order to get the idea of a vacuum motor speeding up and slowing down as they do, I want to um, put another voltage in so that the, the note changes its pitch as it's sounding. And because this will take time, I'm going to slow the tune down a little bit. I'm going to change the shape of the notes here and introduce this That's more like a vacuum cleaner. It's got the sort of feel about it, but it still doesn't have that whirling moustache sound that I particularly want. I think the best way to achieve that is to vary the loudness of the sound very quickly with another oscillator. And I can do that here. There we are. Now, if we go through once again. I'm going to ask it to stop at the end and I'm going to put a long decay. There's a long decay. That's the sound of the mouse disappearing back into its burrow. Here, a futuristic sound is about to be created for a door in Doctor Who. First, the original sound in the studio. Wait here, please. Instead of scraping along, the door must sound as if it glides. Dick Mills first generates some white noise as part of the new sound he'll dub over the original soundtrack. Having timed the movement of the door, he can now modify the white noise to the precise pitch and quality he requires. And here it is. He's now ready to dub the new sound over the original. Wait here, please. Often the workshop composers like Roger Lim first try out their ideas on a conventional piano. was to experiment on a keyboard synthesizer to select the most appropriate types of sound. Such instruments can not only simulate everything from a harpsichord or violin to a full brass band, but can also create an almost infinite variety of the shapes of sound we saw earlier. Sounds of instruments as yet uninvented. Here, the object was to achieve some fairly wild noises which might be used as the climax for the titles of this film. The idea was gradually to modify a piece which would begin with conventional instruments. You ready, John? Ready when you are. One, two, three.
Roger Lim now replayed the piece through earphones. Then at the right moment, without singing, he used his speaking voice to trigger the synthesizer, adding words to the tune of the saxophone. Here, the problem facing the composer was a sequence of images filmed for Jonathan Miller's series, The Body in Question. The producer wanted music to match a ticking clock, which could run unobtrusively behind commentary, and yet establish a sense of the 17th century as stylishly as possible. We pick up the story where composer Peter Howell has just been told about this sequence by producer Patrick Uden, and is beginning to discuss his first ideas with him. Yeah, so that's, that's your actual clock, and yeah. we, we, we're locked to that. We're locked to it. We, um, Steve's already cut some pictures to it, yes. Right. So there's no way of altering the no. tempo of that. Yeah. So what you want is... We could alter the... Uh, I mean, you could double it, I suppose. Yes. Or, 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 or but something. The pictures, for example, don't cut directly no, on the right. beat all the time. Right. Um, but you're really talking about uh, having that behind the music that's covering the sequence. Yes, yes. There's a bit... S slow the first, <laughs> yes. the first thing that occurs it's a very accurate that, clock actually yeah, <laughs> not a slow clock the yeah. fact that um, you know you tend to work to sort of um, tempos that you're used to working to and that does sound a bit slow to me or oh, in fact if you um, if you were to do sort of triplets over each mm. beat so it goes tick I don't think so. I, I, um, the sort of thing I was thinking of was much more, it was sort of, um, well, Purcell-ish. I mean, that's the sort of thing that Jonathan's yes. been talking about. Yes. Um, um, can I play it? You yeah, do it okay. Yes, yes if it's that, mm, um, it's got to be that steady pace. Well, we yes. can make the most of that by having um, sort of slightly doubled um, yes. bass line to speed it up a bit. Um, it's got to be fairly stately. sound nice actually now the only other thing of course is that it's got to be at the moment we don't know how long this sequence is going to run because jonathan hasn't written the script yet but uh, <laughs> the the uh it, it it's it's going to have to i would imagine it'll run for something like two and a half minutes so yeah. it's obviously going to have well, to that's sustain rather nice, actually. it makes yes. a nice change to actually have that length of time to play with because yes. it means with a broad tune you can actually get it to go somewhere To achieve the effect of a chorus, Peter Howell tried out his own voice over the music track. So, using his voice, the synthesizer, and a multi-track recorder, the various elements of the piece are built up, layer by layer. One solo performer turning his composition into a complete orchestral work.
Thanks to the new music technology, groups like Pink Floyd and Genesis and avant-garde composers like Stockhausen are today creating strange sounds which only a century ago might not even have been recognized as music. Just 11 years ago, one of the most extraordinary recitals ever was staged at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, London. The next item, Partita for Unattended Computer by Peter Zinoviev, is a true live performance in the sense that no magnetic tape is being used at all. Furthermore, the computer has a choice at various stages in the procedure, and the piece therefore comes out different every time it's played. The performance you're about to hear is therefore unique and unrepeatable. First of all, checks are made to see that the composition is correctly loaded into the computer. When these checks have been carried out, the computer is started and will carry out the performance unattended. the music of the future or a case of Emperor's new clothes certainly the audience if not some of the critics at that time took it all very seriously but concerts like this one have yet to catch on universally the man behind that recital is one of a new breed of musicians Peter Zinoviev is both a composer and an electronics whiz kid. A decade ago, he was already developing the hardware of synthetic music, while at the same time, venturing into the uncharted music potential of computers. His synthesizers have achieved commercial success, though he would probably prefer the musical success, so far largely denied him. Today, he's converted a huge house near Oxford into a music laboratory where he explores the outer space of what he considers the music of tomorrow. Using one of his own synthesizers, he plays, records, transmutes and modifies vintage scores as data for his computer. Right. In a converted garden shed near the house are both his computer and multi-track recording equipment. Right, now, Robin, can we have, a, have the original, please? A lot of fumbles, but let's record it. Zinoviev is intrigued by the computer because it has, in theory, the capacity to introduce into synthetic music the spontaneous, unpredictable quality of the human player. He now types instructions into the computer about how it should juggle the notes it has remembered and replay them in a semi-random fashion, speeding some up, slowing others down. On a visual display, he can see the original music data prior to being modified by the computer. All seems ready now to hand over to the computer. Right now, let's transform it. High Street, London, not traditionally a mecca of music, but typical of the way the new technology of sound is enabling the more enterprising to do their own thing in every sense. This is the tiny studio of David Vorhaus, again both inventor and composer. Working at his best in the early hours of the morning, Vorhaus is developing his own approach to music. Well, 
this invention I call the maniac. It's an analog sequencer, that's what the A stands for. The advantage of analog sequences is that you can actually play the instrument while it's happening and see the music happening in front of you. This way it helps you compose the music because as you experiment, you come up with new ideas, often better than the original. You can take notes out, put other notes in, or bring in whole new sequences. Maniac's multiphasic means you can split it into one, two, three, or four different sequences, and they all play their riffs in counterpoint with each other. You can change the note lengths this way, or in this respect, and you can also change the pitches because. Maniac is automatically tuned digitally, chromatophonic. It's also polyphonic, but unfortunately there's no P in Maniac. If you want to change key, any or all of the sequences will change key at the same time, and you get the slower keyboard. If you just want to improvise with the skip switches, or change the note lengths, but you want a sequence to keep to some particular bar length, and you don't want to keep score, Switch in the Time Warp Navigator. It does it all for you. You can turn sequences upside down. Or back to front. Or you can get them to harmonize, add, subtract from each other. Streams of pulses that you would play with. Synthesizers have problems in that you start out with very square waves in both senses of the word. They're not nearly as interesting as, as an acoustic sound, which is always changing. Even if you hear a piano just play middle C, you look at it on an oscilloscope, there are amazing patterns happening. Whereas a synthesizer turns it out square and all the same. And it's, it's a dead sound, so you have to do an awful lot. Um, delay lines, flanges, phasers, um, mark space ratio controllers, and all sorts of things to brighten the sound up and make it interesting. It's funny how uh, our ears have become accustomed to the 12 or so different sounds of the orchestra, which through centuries of history have filtered down to very, very fine sounds. And here we can make an infinite number of sounds, but sadly, all but the 12 uh, sound, not all but the 12, an awful lot of them just sound plain, boring electronic. And you really have to work on a sound to get it good. <laughs> Warhouse calls his musical drain pipe, with its strings of electrically conductive tape, the Kaleidophon. Instead of using remote control devices, the Kaleidophon is sensitive to touch. The harder you press the strings, the louder and brighter the sound. It gives the direct response of traditional instruments. When you slide your fingers up and down, the notes don't blur into a whine, but come up clear and distinct. It makes it easier to play fast runs in tune. There are switches which give rapid repeated notes, otherwise very difficult to play by hand. The fact is, music does develop. It's uh, always done so, otherwise it would still sound like Palestrina and Monteverdi's music. Um, this this change, this development, also doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, the, the changes in society affect the changes in music very directly. And let's face it, for better or for worse, 
The fastest happening change now is technology, electronics. And it's just inevitable that this is going to get into the music of today and of tomorrow. Let's hope and try and make it for the better. Vorhaus switched on his Maniac sequencer to provide the backing for a live performance on his other invention, the Kaleidophon. <laughs> just a tiny sample of the sounds technology now offers the musician. Are we witnessing technological self-indulgence? Or is music going through an exciting period of development? I find it reassuring to remember that this development never stops. Be it spinet, serpent, sousaphone or synthesizer, there has always been a new sound of music. However bizarre some of it may sound today, we're perhaps privileged to be witnessing this development at a time when technology is presenting a range of possibilities wider than ever before. It took some respected composers 30 years to accept the pianoforte as a serious instrument. Judged on that time scale, this revolution has hardly begun. A reminder that next week, The World on Monday can be seen at the earlier time of 8 o'clock and it's a 90-minute special on nuclear war. Don't miss Nuclear Nightmares, next on The World on Monday at 8 o'clock next Monday on ABC.